When you're a big shot at the world finals of any team sport, gunning for that gold, you definitely want some top-notch players on the bench. You know, those folks who are ready to jump into the game when one of your usual players is either nursing an injury or feeling way too tired. This holds true not only in most competitive team sports, but also on the battlefield. And the two current global powers, the US and China, are very, very aware of this. So what would a potential conflict between China, the United States, and their respective allies actually look like? Which other military powers would both countries utilize to maximize their combat power? And could the recruitment of powerful allies be enough to turn the tides in a potential war? Let's find out. One of the features of a future China-US war would almost certainly be its multilateralism. There are plenty of reasons to assume neither power would go to war on its own. The US has spent four generations building a global network of alliances and partnerships which give it crucial regional access, basing opportunities, and deterrence capabilities. Its commitment to ensuring Taiwan could hold out in the event of an amphibious Chinese invasion have been relatively steadfast since the 1950s. As part of its Indo-Pacific strategy, the past few presidential administrations have been strengthening strategic relationships with key players in the Pacific to serve as a crucial counterweight to Chinese influence. These include ironclad treaty alliances with Australia, the Philippines, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and Thailand. Recent events show the US is expanding its network even further, acting on its intention to support a strong India as a partner in its positive regional vision. More on that later. The Chinese haven't been nearly as gung-ho about building effective military alliances as the United States, which could come back to haunt them. Earlier this year, as Australia, the UK and the US formalized their new trilateral AUKUS partnership to help Australia develop and deploy its own fleet of nuclear-powered submarines, Xi Jinping conducted a summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Xi claimed the meeting heralded a new era of Sino-Russian cooperation, yet the meeting's accompanying statement only committed the two states to vague cooperative activities like joint production of television programs. There was no formal alliance. There was no overt commitment of Chinese military assistance to Russia's flagging war in Ukraine, and that might be a red flag for the PRC. Some experts have called China's commitment issues an alliance allergy. It's certainly a head-scratcher on its surface. Alliances are notoriously powerful tools for tilting the balance of power away from hegemonic states, something China is clearly trying to do. Yet, China's posturing isn't as atypical as it seems. Four of the world's most powerful rising powers of the past century, the United States, Japan, Germany, and the Soviet Union, each exhibited similar tendencies. Wary of entrapment, unnecessary financial burdens, and weak regional military partners, China has similarly adhered to its independent and self-reliant foreign policy since World War II. It wanted to control every aspect of its staggering economic and military transformation in the 21st century, even if it meant that its sole remaining alliance partner is the perennially failing state of North Korea. China's confidence in its own military potential and economic growth may not be enough to best the United States and its allies in the Pacific. In 2021, the United States' six primary East Asian allies alone managed to collectively spend $149.7 billion in defense, already half of China's $293.3 billion, and 37 times more than North Korea's paltry $4 billion. For comparison, the United States spent $732 billion, and while defense spending doesn't perfectly correlate with military preparedness, it does go a long way. Optimally, the US-led network of Indo-Pacific states would be able to handle themselves in a theoretical war against China. They are a long way from that. A war could hinge not only on numbers of warships, missiles, and aircraft, but on industrial production, cybersecurity, intelligence, geography, technology, and interoperability. In all of these capabilities, Japan, South Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand lag far behind the Chinese. This year has been touted as the most transformative year in U.S. force posture in the Indo-Pacific region in a generation. The U.S. is the great equalizer in the equation, but there is fear Beijing's robust navy, backed by air power and carrier-killer ballistic missiles, are already sufficient to inflict unacceptable losses on American military forces in a prospective war. 
Naturally, the next play for the US is to try and create an uncontestable advantage and deterrent, and in the calculation of top American strategists, the best way to do that is to firmly recruit India into its cooperative orbit. And that is where things get a bit stickier. You see, it's easy to make the wrong assumptions about India, especially believing it would seamlessly float into the American orbit and become a trustworthy ally and military partner. Historically, India was a leader of the unaligned movement, a coalition of nations who tried to remain aloof from the bipolar power struggle between the US and the USSR. When, in the 21st century, China ascended to the rarefied air of revisionist great power once held by the USSR, India began to realize it could not afford to remain neutral. Sharing a combustible Himalayan border with the Chinese, India today has charted a pragmatic foreign policy with the West, seeking economic benefits and possible military cooperation as a precautionary measure in the event of a major war. In theory, India has no choice but to hedge against China by aligning with the West. China outclasses its military in virtually every category, including better missile and naval technology, a larger defense budget, more advanced combat platforms, and most vitally, a lot more of them. China might not be producing the cream of the crop in terms of modern weapon systems, but thanks to its robust domestic arms manufacturing capabilities, it can create advanced weapons at a far cheaper cost than if it had to import them. It boasts among the world's best air-to-air -air missiles, especially the PL-15. India has tried to break even with arms projects of its own, but hasn't had the same success. Just take the creation of the Arjun main battle tank, a platform which entered development in 1985 and was still in development, let me check my calendar, 26 years later. It all seems quite simple then, right? China the angry neighbor, the US the willing partner, India caught in the middle, fielding a perfect opportunity to resolve its security dilemma by establishing a stronger relationship with Washington. In practice, India's pre-existing geopolitical relationships make its budding bromance with the US even murkier. You see, arguably India's greatest geopolitical friendship is the one it enjoys with Russia. Yes, that Russia. India's affinity with Russia dates back to the Cold War, where the two forged close economic and military ties in response to the Indian-Pakistani conflict over control of Kashmir. The Soviets backed India when tensions flared up again in that region in 1971, signing a treaty of peace, friendship and cooperation that same year. This opened up many avenues of cooperation, especially in areas of defense, oil, nuclear energy, and space exploration. India and Russia's current post-Soviet friendship continues to manifest itself in a variety of ways, including India's extensive reliance on Russian-sold arms, its decision to abstain from condemning Russia's actions in Ukraine, and their participation in BRICS, a multinational body comprised of nations with markedly different perspectives on global affairs including China and Russia. As of 1991, arms sales from the USSR represented 70% of all Indian Army weapons, 80% of its air force systems, and 85% of its navy platforms. Its first aircraft carrier, the INS Vikramaditya, was Russian-made too. Its air force operates more than 410 Soviet and Russian fighters, and its submarine, helicopter, tank, and missile arsenals are predominantly ex-Soviet stock. So yes, considering how messy it would be to curtail access to the Russian spare parts and systems needed to maintain virtually its entire military, convincing India to cut ties with Russia is a tall task for Washington, especially when many Indians today still openly consider the Russians their brothers-in-arms. The winds of change are blowing, however, while the task of building a viable US-Indian partnership is staggeringly complex, that isn't to say it's impossible. As Russia and China grow closer, Washington has not delayed in courting Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, offering military support packages, political legitimacy, and economic partnerships Putin can no longer promise. Russia's catastrophic military performance in Ukraine has also underpinned the visceral, mechanical, and operational failures of Russia's military systems in every domain. India had already significantly slowed its imports of Russian weapons prior to the 2022 invasion of Ukraine, dipping from 64% in 2018 to 45% of its stock in 2022. India famously even backed out of its joint development of the Su-57 advanced fighter system, as it became apparent that it could not seriously compete with America's fifth-generation fighters. Make no mistake, 
India has its eyes set on a conflict with China and must prepare accordingly. To compete militarily with the Chinese threat, it will, according to most experts, have to first ditch Russia. It might not have as much time as it needs. India has a respectful level of combat experience, stretching back into its bloody conflicts with Pakistan in the twilight of the 20th century. Yet today, while violence continues between the Indian Army and Pakistan-backed groups along the border regions of West and Northwest India, by far the biggest flashpoint of tension remains along the 2,100-mile-long Himalayan border it shares with China. Skirmishes along what some consider the most dangerous border in the world have been erupting here for decades. Most recently, in December 2022, tensions between Chinese and Indian forces came to a head in the worst fight at what both sides call the Line of Actual Control, or LAC, since 2020. That year, a famous brawl notorious for its fighters' use of a medieval array of rocks, fists, and clubs, some even embedded with nails and wrapped in barbed wire, erupted in the Galwan Valley. As you might have expected, prohibitions on firearms in the LAC did not deter soldiers on either side. The bloody four-hour brawl claimed the lives of 20 Indian and four Chinese soldiers, many of whom died from exposure to the elements, several more having fallen from cliffs into the Galwan River. The episode, and others like it, have inflamed tensions between China and India even further. Their military buildup in the region continues without any signs of stopping, with tensions threatening to spill out into an all-out war. Fortunately for both, geography renders both nations virtually immune to outside invasions. Windy mountain roads and extreme terrain would wreak havoc on critical logistical pipelines. Yet even if India lost territory to Chinese forces along the border, its national security would still be intact. Positioned strategically astride China's trade jugular, India could use naval power to threaten Chinese exports throughout the Indian Ocean and Malacca Strait, through which a vast portion of its energy and economic exports travel. India's lone aircraft carrier would feature prominently in any potential blue water operations against China. It's currently in the process of building another, and it would certainly need both if it hoped to deny China's access to these crucial sea lanes. With over seven American aircraft carriers patrolling the Pacific at any given moment, and half a dozen more undergoing routine maintenance, naval interdiction would obviously be an area the United States would excel in in any future war, assuming India opted to join forces. Taking a page out of China's own book, more recently India has endeavored to build its own new naval base right at the mouth of the Malacca Strait on Grand Nicobar Island. The decision, which was made to secure India's own strategic waterways and confer legitimacy on its position as a regional power, caused an uproar in Beijing. Chinese policymakers likened the Grand Nicobar facility to a guillotine stretching over China's exposed and very long neck, stretching from its southern shores all the way to the Middle East. China knows its trade networks are in grave danger. As the PRC has expanded its global reach vis-a-vis -vis programs like the Belt and Road Initiative, its military strategy has been to build a turtle-style defense shell around the East and South China Seas and Strait of Taiwan. They call this anti-access area denial. A2AD. The system interlaces overlapping fields of anti-ship, anti-air, anti-ballistic missile systems, submarines, and other naval and aerial capabilities to alter the strategic environment in the Western Pacific, limiting the ability of the United States and its military partners to intervene in regional conflicts. Were India to join the burgeoning US-led Indo-Pacific coalition of states, Washington would have an effective means of countering the Chinese A2AD threat supporting an allied buildup on the Indian subcontinent, which would further threaten China's ability to conduct trade and military exercises beyond the first island chain and throughout the Indian Ocean. So if war were to ever break out between the United States and China in the Indo-Pacific, India could be key in tilting the military balance of power, Russia not so much. As China's major partner, Russia probably presents more of a liability than a boon at this point. Putin's military has demonstrated that it can barely fight a modern combined arms conflict adjacent to its own territory, much less excel or even assist in a conflict with distinct air and naval dimensionality. Most telling of all is the incredible impact that an outsized amount of advanced Western material has had in shaping Ukraine's war against Russia. In 2022, the US deployed several HIMARS batteries to Ukraine to provide long-range and accurate artillery fire. 
The system transformed Ukraine's tactical fortunes almost overnight, killing generals and top commanders and devastating Russian command posts, logistics nodes, supply zones and artillery batteries. Western arms and intelligence primed Ukraine's fall 2022 counteroffensive and prevented further territorial losses when Russia bloodlet itself in its savage human wave attacks on Bakhmut over the previous winter. For comparison, the US has over 400 HIMARS batteries of its own, an order of magnitude greater than those utilized by Ukraine of late. If anything, Russia has proven to the world that the operations it can most admirably conduct are digging in, throwing poorly trained, ill-equipped conscripts into the trenches and praying their Soviet vintage minefields hold true. That is, if it has months to prepare. It's not yet clear whether this tactic will have any discernible impact in a major war involving China. But with North Korea the only other true suitor, China is scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of reputable allies. The truth of the matter is that Russia's air and naval assets are crumbling, the two things which could impact the outcome of a potential conflict against a US-Indian alliance. Russia's air force has barely registered its presence in the war against Ukraine, with Putin only committing a portion of his available assets to that fight. We now have a better idea of why. Russia is struggling to recruit and train qualified pilots. While systems maintenance have deteriorated, a leaked memo revealed that Russia has had to send many training instructors into the war zone, compounding the kink in its training pipeline when they did not come back. Russian pilots are reported to only receive somewhere in the ballpark of 70 to 120 flight hours a year. If they're lucky, their pilots receive a maximum of 200 hours of flight training before joining a combat-ready squadron. In comparison, American pilots receive even more hours than this on a training simulator before even climbing into the cockpit of a fighter jet. Their first 25 hours of true flight training come in propeller-driven aircraft. The next phase is a specialized undergraduate training program, coupling classroom instruction with 90 hours of additional flights in other propeller-driven aircraft. Then, 115 hours later, they are assigned to the aircraft they'll fly in active service. Fighter and bomber pilots fly 100-plus hours in a jet trainer aircraft for their next phase of training. By then, they've accumulated more hours than their Russian counterparts will by the time they've reached the battlefield. These American pilots won't be combat-ready until they've completed another 20-hour intro to Fighter Fundamentals course. That, of course, is before they spend another year in their dedicated airframe. By the time they join their combat-ready squadron, they've got as many flight hours as a war-weary Russian combat veteran. The pilot crisis is just one dimension of the cracks in Russia's military effectiveness. It struggles to conduct the most basic of joint operations. If they allied with China, cooperations become even more difficult. Sure, the US would have to deal with the language barrier with most of its East Asian allies, yet it has a proven track record of long-term cooperation in multinational military settings staging large-scale joint combined military exercises with a diverse array of partners across the globe to simulate harsh wartime conditions. The US too boasts decades of experience building resilient alliance systems like NATO, whose integrated command functions and daily practices promote interoperability on every level. These strengths wouldn't easily transfer over to the Indo-Pacific battle space, but any starting point is better than no starting point. As a parting example of the importance of familiarity and trust in one's partners as the bedrock of joint and combined operations, take the United States' role in Operation Desert Storm. In that conflict, the United States managed to clear Iraqi airspace of all threats, suffering only a handful of casualties and friendly fire incidents in the process. This was an impressive feat, considering the fact that the coalition was fielding over 4,000 aircraft at the time. By comparison, Russia has been trying to field a few hundred platforms in airspace half the size, landing almost as many kills on its own airframes as Ukraine has. Just last month, Russia shot down its own Su-35 jet for a second time within a matter of days. According to a sarcastic Russian military blogger, at this rate of work from our valiant air defense, we'll soon be left without aviation. Add to this recent intelligence leaks indicating that Russia has resorted to the time-tested tactic of executing conscripts who refuse to follow orders, and threatening to execute entire units if they seek to retreat from Ukrainian artillery fire, and you have a recipe for disaster, especially if they ever hope to cohere with Chinese air and ground forces. Assuming a theoretical conflict remained conventional, China would have to do the most of the heavy lifting. It didn't have to be this way. Russia has done the entire Western world a favor playing its hand in Ukraine, 
revealing that it can contribute little in terms of military support in its tentative military partnership with the PRC. For now, the jury is still out on India. If it had the United States and its 50 allies and partners clearing the skies and seas over the Pacific, who, by the way, spend a third of the world's entire annual defense budget, it could play a notable role offering a credible threat to Chinese trade. Indian ships could bolster American expeditionary logistical capabilities, offer medical facilities, and serve as a jumping-off point for the containment of the PRC between the Straits of Malacca and the Gulf of Oman. In the end, a US-Indian alliance is simply too powerful for a Sino-Russian alliance to overcome. This growing partnership could ensure that China's ambitions to dominate Asia and upset the liberal world order remain nothing but a pipe dream. But what are your thoughts on this? In a face-off between China and the US and their respective allies, who would win and why? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.